Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar, DMARC, You Have a Plan, Now What? My name is Shazad Mirza. I'm the Director of Operations for the New York City office. So in this webinar, we're going to focus strictly on the actual implementation. So what is needed for, impl for proper implementation and what is needed to create a proper DMARC policy. So before we get into that, just want to quickly go over what DMARC is again. So DMARC stands for Domain-Based Message Authentication Reporting and Informants. So basically like an identity check for your organization's domain name. So what DMARC is going to do is going to allow you to create a policy in which you as the sender, sending organization can say that these messages are being protected by uh, two different authentication mechanisms. And this is what you need to do if those authentication mechanisms were to pass or to fail. So this way the receiving side is going to know what happens then. They don't have to make a decision to determine what to do with that message. So they just need to come back, look at your policy and say, okay, they have a DMARC policy. We check the authentication mechanisms and okay, in this case, say for example, the authentication mechanisms were to pass, the message is going to be delivered to the recipient's inbox. But if one of those authentication mechanisms were to fail, then depending on your policy level, that message could potentially go into the junk or spam folder, or the message could be completely rejected. So what DMARC is doing overall is protecting your brand and protecting your specific domain name from being used by spammers or any unauthorized systems. So now in terms of the actual implementation, so one thing you need to consider when you're doing the implementation is the two authentication mechanisms that DMARC uses. Those are sender policy framework and domain keys identified mail. Now sender policy framework is the most more widely used mechanism that is out there because it's going to define which servers are authorized to send mail on your behalf. So these could be your own mail server, actually will be your own mail servers, but these could also be third party servers. So you could be using like marketing tools or maybe you have some internal applications that send out mail that aren't your standard mail services or using your standard, standard mail services. So you're gonna add those into the SPF policy. Now the nice thing about SPF is that you're just using DNS to create the SPF record and you're gonna create a TXT record. So it's a TXT record that you're creating inside of whatever DNS system that you're using. Then the other part is that for DMARC to function appropriately is to use domain keys identified mail or DKIM. So DKIM is going to add a digital signature. So therefore you have an, like an additional layer of authentication for, for the sender. Because so what you're doing here is now kind of, is using private key, public key capabilities. So depending on which systems you use, you could end up the private key. If you're creating this on your own, you're storing the private key internal to your own uh, environment and then you're publishing the public key on DNS. So this way, every message that comes or leaves your environment, for example, will automatically be signed with the signature. The recipient will receive it, and then the recipient is going to go back and check with the public key to make sure that it is the correct signature and that everything matches accordingly. So DMARC is going to use the power and the benefits of both of these and reduce the risks that are associated with SPF and DKIM, and, and if not, eliminate those risks uh, when you implement this. Now, both SPF and the DKIM are going to be TXT records that you create uh, on your DNS, whether it be your internal DNS system, or, or sorry, the public DNS system that you own, or if it's a third-party vendor that you're using like GoDaddy or Network Solutions, that's where you would end up creating the, the TXT record. And I'll show you some examples of what those would look like. Now, the main focus here is actually the DMARC implementation. So as part of the 90 day challenge that we're doing here is we're getting and trying to help people get to at least a minimum to the policy level of none. So what is policy level of none? What the policy settings are going to define in a DMARC, in DMARC is going to indicate what happens with those messages. So the recipient is going to define and dictate what happens with those messages. Uh, actually, before I continue on, there was a, there is a question on the previous slide. So if both are required, does that mean we cannot monitor SPF for a while and then later turn on DKIM? Actually, you can do that, and I'll explain how you can do that. 
Uh, so you can monitor SPF for a while and then later on decan, uh, turn on decan. Uh, so what you'd have to do in order to do that is start off with the policy, DMARC policy level of none. So that way you are in monitoring mode and that's the whole purpose of being at none and the reason of, be, of starting at none because you can get those reports that are generated by DMARC and in those reports, take a look and see what's going on with SPF and then make the adjustments to SPF. And then if you want to work on DKIM afterwards, then you can always work on DKIM afterwards. It's probably better to actually work with both in conjunction. You know, maybe start off with SPF and update the SPF record as needed. But if there's a case where you're look, working with one of the third party vendors, do both. Update your SPF record and then ask them for the DKIM information so that way you can implement that at the same time. So that way you're reducing and eliminating any other false positives that you may see in the reports. But of course, that's the main essence of staying at none is because you want to get those. Okay, and that's like the question asked, you put in yourself in putting yourself in monitored only mode. But you don't want to stay at none for too long because staying at none is not doing any level of enforcement or using the full power of DMARC. You want to get to quarantine and then to reject. So what quarantine will do is if one of those checks were to fail, and that includes the alignment check. So alignment means domain alignment check. So it's making sure SPF and DKIM not, all, not only are passing or failing, but also making sure that SPF and DKIM is using the appropriate domain, meaning that it matches your domain, not some, not being, not some other domain. But at quarantine, the message is sent to spam or the junk folder. It's kind of like a safety net, but you don't want to stay at that safety net for too long because what could potentially happen is if that a lot of your legitimate messages actually get quarantined, the recipient may eventually think, oh, okay, well, maybe just by accident it went in again into the spam or junk folder. So maybe this one message is actually legitimate. But well, in, in fact, it's actually not a legitimate mail. It came from an unauthorized source. So you don't want to stay in quarantine too long because it can hurt your reputation after some time. You want to make sure you get to the highest level of reject because at reject, if any of the authentication mechanisms fail, the message is not delivered whatsoever. But just remember, you can still get reports regardless of which policy level uh, you set yourself to. So non-quarantine and reject, you can still get reports at each of those levels and review those reports and make the adjustments as you need to. I'm not going to get into reports into the, in this webinar. That will be for next month. But I just want to make sure that I reiterated that uh, you know you can get reports at any level. Now, what does DMARC actually look like in DNS? So the DMARC record looks like this, for example, as, as two examples here. So in order to get started right away, all you need is that first one that's listed up top in the basic section. You can implement this now and start yourself in monitor only mode and do whatever you and do with the checks the spf checking and the dkim checking and make the adjustments before you move in you don't need actually anything more than that so what you're going to do is you for the host name it has to start with underscore dmark it you have to have the underscore it can't be dmark dot and then your domain name it can't be just your domain name it has to be underscore dmark that's the name of the host or the name of the txt record then the value is going to be what you see on the next line. V equals D mark one. That's your version number. It's always going to be D mark one. There is no reports or any talk of an, any additional version of D mark coming out. So it'll always be D mark one. Also make sure it's capitalized. So D mark has to be capitalized in this instance. Then the next, and then make sure you have that semicolon. So semicolons are important. After the semicolon, put a space and then the P tag. That's your policy level you're defining. So P equals none. When you're ready to move up to quarantine or reject, then all you have to do is change the value from, of the tag from none to quarantine or to reject, depending on which policy level you're going to. That's how simple it is. You just make that simple change right there. But just make sure the spelling is correct, especially with quarantine. I've done it numerous times. But it doesn't break anything, but it just prevents this from actually working. Then the RUA tag is for reporting. It's more specifically is for aggregate reporting. I'm going to talk a little bit about it just really quickly because it's relevant to the, what we're seeing here. The aggregate report is the report you want to get. That's the report that's going to tell you which IP addresses are sending mail on your behalf. Hopefully, it's only the authorized ones. But you'll also see unauthorized ones or ones you may not even be aware of. 
it'd be a full report of that all that information. So IP addresses are sending domains on your behalf to specific recipients. It also will tell you about your DKIM and SPF. So it will explain to it'll tell you whether DKIM is passing or failing, if it's aligned or unaligned, and what domain is being used to sign that DKIM. To, what, to, to, what domain is being used to sign that message? Same with SPF. It'll tell you if it passes or fails. It tells you whether it's aligned or unaligned, and what domain is being used for that SPF. So that way you can see where it's coming from and making sure that everything is current is correct and aligned correctly. So that's what the RUA tag is going to do. If you just go ahead and start with this, this will get you started, this will get you going. On the complex side, there are more tags that are available that you can use if you choose to, but you can always add these at a later time just to see you know, what the capabilities are. So for example, the RUF tag. So at this, we're on the third line in the complex. So under value, right under value, you'll see RUF. RUF is for your failure or forensic reports. We kind of left that out in terms of the on the on the you know implementing it right away, mainly because of the fact that forensic reports seem to be diminishing. So meaning that uh, not many receiving receive recipient sides are sending those types of reports, mainly because of PII. There's a privacy conce privacy concern with the failure reports because those reports will actually contain the full message. So you'll have the sender, uh, the, the sender address, the recipient address. You'll have the subject, uh, the subject line there. It'll have, contain the full message that was the message body in there. So people have concerns about that because it, it, it could have sensitive information. It could have banking information. It could potentially have social security information in there. I know there are countries already that said that they will not will not use forensic reports and don't want people using forensic reports. Um, Google and Hotmail and Microsoft have decided already not to send forensic reports. All of them do send aggregate reports. All the consumer side recipients do send aggregate reports like the consumer ISPs, but majority of them are starting to no longer send the forensic reports. If you want to add it, you can add it. It's not gonna hurt anything by adding it to that. But you know, just to take that account in case you do not get any, that's the reason why you're not getting any. The other one, so like the FO tag has to also do with failure reports. If you don't use it, this the FO tag is more in terms of when to trigger the failure reports. Um, you only need that if you're gonna use the R RUF tag. The ADKIM and ASPF is to define how strict or relaxed to follow the domain alignment. Uh, it's recommended to start off with R. So R is for relaxed. Um, if you do not add either one ADKIM or ASP tags, by default, it will be at the relaxed stage. So you don't need to have this in there unless you want to explicitly define it. The percentage, the PCT tag is what number of messages will be impacted by the policy. Don't recommend, again, using that. Leave it at 100% so that way you can, it makes it easier for you to determine which messages are being, you know, which messages to look for and then when you do your analysis. The RF is report format. Again, if you don't define that, it's just going to use the AFRF tag, which is the default for the X, for XML. RI tag is reporting interval. This one you can choose and increase and decrease as you choose to. By default, it's 86,400. So if you do not implement it, it will go with the 24 hour period. I only recommend increasing it when you go to reject. But when you're at none, either leave it at 24 hours or reduce it so that way you can, depending on how quickly you're looking to get to the quarantine or the reject level. And then SP equals reject. SP is for subdomain policy. So by default, the P tag will apply to all your top level domains and your sub level domains. But there may be situations where you have an environment where you have multiple subdomains, but each subdomain is handled by different IT staff. So that IT staff is responsible for that, um, that domain and the email for that domain and they have their own email servers. So in that kind of situation, you may want to have uh, the SP tag included. So you can go from the, the P equals and move that up to quarantine or reject, then put your SP tag equal to none. So then this way, your subdomains can have their own policies and get up to reject. And when they're ready, then you can make whatever adjustments you need to make. 
or it could go the other way around. If you're still at P equals none and you know for a fact that you do not have any subdomains, put in SP equals reject. So this way spammers and fishers cannot use subdomains for your organization in, spam, in spamming and phishing type of attempts. So this means like m.globalcyberalliance.org or hr.globalcyberalliance.org. Those are your subdomains. So like GCA, we didn't, when we first started, we, we were just globalcyberalliance.org. We weren't broken down into multiple subdomains. So we put in SP equals reject because we didn't want people using any version of our name using a subdomain until we got up to as to p equals reject and then at that point we could remove the sp tag because the p tag applies to both so we have another question here is we uh we have external customers third parties that send on our behalf do we need to identify them and send them our deacon public key so their messages won't fail also ensure that we have their sending ips added to our spf records so for the spf side you do need to add them to your spf record because that makes them authorized to send it in terms of DKIM, work with the third party because they have their own settings for DKIM. Do not give them your DKIM public key because if you give them the public key, you're going to have to give them the private key as well because otherwise it won't work. Third party vendors, majority of them will have their own DKIM configuration and own key DKIM setting where they handle the private key and public keys. They just give you the record that you need to create in DNS. So it's highly recommended to work with those third parties. If you do have questions about th certain third parties, email me and we can, I can let you, I can help you and uh, if we have information about any of those third parties. So now before I go to the next slide, what I want to show everyone is kind of a, a little step-by-step -step process in terms of actually doing the DMARC process. So we do have a setup guide, which is available. It's, it's available for free. It's at dmarcguide.globalcyberalliance.org. And what this is, is basically step-by-step -step go you through the tutorial of how to set up DMARC. So all the values that we were talking about in the, in the slide, this will go through that entire process. So in this case, I'm gonna use gotdmark.org. It's actually a domain that GCA owns, so I can actually go through it. So in this case, you can see we have SPF, we have an DKIM set up for this record, but we don't have DMARC. We actually had DMARC, I removed it just for this webinar. So I can show you and go through the process. Now, this process you can go through as many times as you want, regardless of whether you have SPF, DKIM, or DMARC. So all you have to do is click on whichever tutorial you would like to, just click on it and then press next. So I'm gonna press next in this case. So it starts off the tutorial and explains to you what DMARC is first. So we got DMARC, this is what we're starting off, and then it goes through a series of questions. So in this case, what should the policy level be for DMARC? So in our case here, we're going to say like, well, we don't really know. And we're recommending going with none, starting off with none first. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go start with none. So this is going to tell you, this is the P tag. Hit next, where should we send the reports to? So it's strongly recommended that these reports get sent to an account um, on, that, you, that you have uh, for your domain. So this is, sorry, gotdmark.org. For reports, send it to a generic account because you could potentially get inundated with a whole lot of reports. So create a generic account, send them to that uh, account and give access to people that you need to give access to. And below, it's gonna just give you examples of what the, uh, the reports look like and with some of the vendors that are partners um, that you can use to for report analysis and things like that. Uh, I'm gonna press next. Now, if you want to send forensic reports, this is where you can input your forensic reports. I'm going to skip this step for now. And then if we have subdomains, so a DMARC policy for subdomains, what do you want to do? And this is going to be the SP tag. So I'm going to go with reject because gotdmark.org is a brand new domain. Nobody's actually using it. So we're going to straight to reject for subdomains because there are no subdomains whatsoever. So we're going to select that and press next and then the rest of these tags are optional so these were the ones that i was mentioning before in terms of the fo tag and so on so this is when should the error report of the uh, the failure reports be generated and how often should they be generated what's the alignment mode you want for dkim so in terms of the uh the domain alignment so this means like it shows here so if you're going to use the r tag which is the default if not defined it allows for any subdomain defined in the dkim header or you can go with strict, so it must match the do do domain in the DKIM header exactly. Same thing for SPF. 
what's the percent of a message, message subject by DMARC policy. So you can change this if you wish to change it. I recommend leaving it at 100%. You can change the format of the reports. So these are the two formats. It's really just the RFI, or, sorry, the RFC of them, but they're both really XML. What the reporting interval will be. Again, if you're at none, I either say, I recommend either stay right where it is or reduce the number, depending on how quick you're looking to go. Do not increase the number. Uh, and if you're not sure how to uh, how many what how many the seconds and hours, we have a seconds and hours to converter. And then you just press finish, and what this will do is it give you an example of what your DMARC record will look like. So you're not going to necessarily need everything that you see here when you create the actual TXT record. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to actually create a TXT record using GoDaddy for GodDMark.org. So on this other tab here, this is where I'm already logged into GoDaddy for GodDMark.org, and I'm on the DNS management tab for, uh, for, this, for this domain. So what I want to do here is since I know there's no DMARC created, I'm going to click on the Add button here. And then in the Add button, I'm going to create a TXT record, right? Because that is what type of DNS record you're creating for DMARC. The host is always going to be underscore DMARC. Oops, underscore. Underscore DMARC, not dash. Underscore DMARC. So that's where you see this in the first part. You don't need the full thing or the full name in order to put this in. Because by default, it's going to know that this is part of goddmark.org, and that is most that is the same in most cases uh, for other DNS providers. So network solutions on Windows, on Linux machines, it's the same thing. All you have to do is provide the underscore DMARC. Next is the TXT value. So the TXT value is going to be what is in between the quotes. So this is where I'm going to take this information. I will copy it and then go ahead and paste it in here. So this is putting in the V equals D mark, the policy level of none, RUA equals mail to, and where it's going to send the message to. The subdomains are going to be rejected, and by default, that actually put in 100% for uh, uh, the number of report for the D mark policy, and then the reporting interval as well as the default. Here you can change the time to live. For it, if you choose to, you can leave it to an hour, if you know, or you can increase or decrease. I'll leave that up to you on what you need to, what you decide. And then all you have to do now is click on save, and now I have DMARC in place for uh, got D, uh, got DMARC.org. That's it. As you can see, it took us about less than a minute to go through and actually put this in. It took us longer to go through the tutorial than it did to actually put this this record in place uh, into GoDaddy. So this is just the start. Right. So now once you're done with this, the next step is going to be is you get those reports and review those reports and take a look at those reports and see what's going on with those reports. Now, I'm going to do one more thing here as well, because like I mentioned before, gotdmark.org, it's a domain that we own, but it's not actually used for email. So what so the way it's set up right now. So here's the SPF record. It's basically saying that google.com is allowed to send mail on behalf of goddmark.org. And we also have a DKIM signature right here, which was actually created using Google as well. So this is our public key. Now, but the thing is, is that google.com, we actually decided no longer to use Google and we're actually decided that, you know what, we're not gonna actually use this for email. We're just gonna own the domain name. So since I'm no longer using this for email i can still keep everything in place but what i want to do is actually do this i don't want google to be able to send mail using gotdmark.org so and i don't want anyone who's using google.com to be able to send mail using gotdmark.org so i'm just going to remove that part and just keep it like this so it's basically saying that i have using spf version one but reject everything because there is no mail server associated with this so i click on save I'm going to change the DKIM key because it's no longer needed. I'm actually going to delete it because you don't have to have a DKIM key. This is a public domain that is able to be used, but not for email purposes. So I'm going to delete it. And actually, I should go back and delete all these MX records as well. But that's another thing. 
But for DMARC now, what I'm going to do is instead of keeping it at none, I'm going to change it to reject. I'm going to change it to reject at this point, and I'm going to remove this part because this, that part is no longer needed. Now, the email address also needs to get updated as well. Um, I'm just going to put in a bogus one for right now because this one actually does not exist. Because I can't send it to a, uh, since I don't have a, a message, uh, email for um, got DMARC, I'm going to send it to a globalcyberalliance.org address. And then just hit save. So now I just protected this domain using DMARC and prevented anyone else from sending mail using this domain just by adding these two things. So V equals SPF one dash all, and then the DMARC value of DMARC P equals reject. And all I really needed is just this first part and that's it. So it's recommended that if you have public domains that are not used for email, do this. Take these steps and take these actions. And later on, I'll delete all these MX records as well. I'm not gonna do that uh, during the webinar since we need to move on to the next slide. So another thing I wanna talk about um, is just to make sure that people understand that DMARC is not gonna be your cure all to phishing. <laughs> it's not a silver bullet. It's just because you implement DMARC does not mean that phishing is now gonna, you're not gonna get any, you're not gonna get fish, you're not gonna get any spam email message or anything like that. All it means is going to prevent people from using your specific domain name. So the, the DMARC policy for the domain you create, that is what is being protected. It's not gonna protect against variations of that domain name. So meaning if you have a .net version or if you have a um, .com version, so like for example, uh, gotdmark.org, if there's gotdmark.com or gotdmark.net, this policy that we just created does not protect against those .com and .net versions. How do you protect then against that? Well, you can always purchase those domains. Those do domains are fairly cheap. I mean, in most cases, if you find the right site, you can get them for like a dollar or less. And then you can create just what I showed you. Just create a simple SPF record with, not, with just that simple value and create a DMARC policy of reject for that. And then now you have that protected. So that's a variation and that's a mechanism, a way you can protect those and prevent them from being being used. And there is a potential that email could, could break, but that's mainly because people haven't done it correctly. They haven't taken the right steps in order to implement DMARC. One being that they start at reject instead of none. I mean, there, there have been cases where people went straight to reject because they were 100% firm with their environment. So they did it, but they ended up blocking messages that were coming from the CEO or being sent by the CEO or to all their business partners and co uh, consumers. And uh, they ended up finding out from the reports that there was actually a third party tool that was being used. So they had to go back to none, make the changes to SPF, create the DKIM signature with that third party provider, and then they went back to reject in order to and make sure everything is correct. So that's really important. And then also make sure your syntax is correct. It's so like I mentioned before, make sure it's underscore DMARC. Not like dash DMARC, the mistakes I started off with. It should be underscore DMARC. Make sure you spell things correctly. DMARC, the value, uh, the value, um, and the value section, the V equals DMARC one. Make sure DMARC is capitalized. Make sure you spell quarantine correctly. Make sure for the uh, mail, the, the emails that you want the reports to go to, start with mail to colon for each email address. So those things have to be important. If it's not set up correctly, it's not going to break anything. What it will do is just prevent the DMARC policy from actually being used. Other issues are not enough resources because implementation can be time consuming, especially if you have multiple domains. And I see this a lot mainly in like government entities. They'll have different subdomains that, and those subdomains are, are handled by other IT shops and they have their own email uh, servers and things like that. That's where it can be time consuming because trying to get everyone on the same page can be troublesome and can take some time. Now, if you're responsible for the entire domain and all the subdomains, it may not be as difficult, but it could be time consuming because you're probably going to go through each one individually uh, before and, and set up each one individually rather than tackling them all at once. But what we've seen is that a lot of resources are needed more towards uh, reports. Um, because especially if you're a large organization, and you send a lot of messages out on a daily basis, you could get a lot of reports. 
Um, and then that's where DMARC vendors could help, but there's a cost. Um, but again, next month we'll talk about reporting. We'll talk about the different parts of the reports. We'll talk about the vendors that are available, but also give you free tools that are available. If you go to our website, you can go there and if you want to get ahead of the game, they'll have the information is there as well on the website. Uh, DMARC and SPF and DCAM also don't work well with mailing lists and mail forwarders. It actually breaks it. Uh, it breaks all three of them. Um, the only solution to that that's that's been a, that just recently was released last year was authenticated received chain. It actually preserves SPF, DKIM, and DMARC. And so that way that when messages are being forwarded on or being passed on, uh, it maintains those aspects and nothing breaks and everything gets delivered correctly. But it's just up to the mailing list and the mail forwarders to actually do that implementation. So the additional resources that are available for you. So again, you have the dmark.globalcyberalliance.org. There's a lot of information up there. We're gonna be uh, adding the implementation resources hopefully before the, the end, end of the week, if not early next week. Uh, I just showed you the dmarkguide.globalcyberalliance.org. That's free for you to use. Use it as many times as you want. I just showed you the DMARC section, but the same thing applies for SPF and DCAM. You can go through a step-by-step -step process and get ultimately get what your record would look like for DNS and what you would put into DNS. We have a YouTube channel. On the YouTube channel, we have different videos. Um, we have the web, our monthly webinars up there. The setup guide videos are there. But we also have like what I just showed you with um, GoDaddy. We actually go through a full process from setting up Office 365 and using GoDaddy and setting up SPF, setting up DKIM and setting up DMARC. Same thing with Google G Suites. Because I know a lot of people actually are using Office 365, not as many using Google G Suite. But if you go through that process and look at that process, it's almost similar to what you would do for um, other systems as well. And then we do have a few upcoming more webinars. We have one uh, next week, which is an industry panel. This is gonna talk about uh, DMARC and the implementation as well, but you're gonna hear it not from GCA, but you're gonna hear it from some of our partners. So we have some folks from the, UK, the United Kingdom, from a legal association, we have people from New Zealand, we have someone from a US local government, and we also have uh, someone from a US healthcare uh, uh, group as well. So those are the people you get to hear from, so it'd be great if you join uh, one of the two, if not both, uh, those webinar, uh, the, that panel. And then on February 6th and 14th, we're gonna talk about the reporting and analysis. So we have, we picked two dates for it, uh, so that way, you know, we know that reporting and the analysis part happens to be the more troublesome and the more time consuming part for most people. So we wanted to have two days for it. That is also gonna be at two times on the 6th and the 14th. I believe it's at 8 a.m. and 2.30 p.m. as well. So at this point, we're, we're get, we got to the end of the webinar. So I wanna thank everyone for joining. I am gonna stay on in case there are any questions. I'm not, you know, just because the, the, this is the last slide doesn't mean that we're going to necessarily end the webinar. If there are any questions that you have about anything in this webinar or anything else that's DMARC related, please do not hesitate to ask those questions. Uh, you can put the question in the questions box that's available in your control, uh, control panel. Or if you can't think of the question later on or if you just want to digest all the material, please do not hesitate to email at either one of the addresses you see on the slide. So gca-dmark at globalcyberalliance.org, or you can email me directly at smears at globalcyberalliance.org. Both of those, uh, the gca-dmark will also come to me, but also come get to some other additional staff. But the, obviously the smears, I'm giving you my personal address. Feel free to email me directly and I will do my best to help you as best as I can. If I can't get you the answer, we have resources, subject matter experts that we have access to that will get you the answer uh, to you from them and keeping you anonymous to that as well. <laughs> so I'm gonna open up the floor to any questions that people have. If you don't have any questions, again, thank you for joining the webinar. And I hope that we made DMARC implementation a little bit easier for you and that you'll have DMARC implemented hopefully in the next few days or if not weeks. Thank you again. <laughs>